you avoid using Latin names for plants? Do they seem too complicated or unnecessary or even perhaps a bit pretentious? But I've just been sent a children's book called Perfectly Peculiar Plants by Dr Chris Thorogood of the Oxford Botanic Gardens and the plants in it have their Latin names. So I went to the Oxford Botanic Gardens to ask Dr Chris Thorogood to explain it all. The first thing he said is that they're not actually Latin names. Some of them are Greek, so strictly speaking they're called the scientific names of plants. My name is Chris Thurigut and I'm the Deputy Director and Head of Science here at Oxford Botanic Gardens. So before the time of um, a very important naturalist called Carl Linnaeus, um, he introduced the, what we now use, the system of binomial nomenclature. So this is where a, a plant or animal name has two parts, the generic name the, for the first word and then the specific epithet which is the second word and it's written in italics and that's what um, you and I call the, the scientific name of, of a plant or animal. And that's really important because it helps us to consistently make sense of the seeming, seemingly chaotic um, diversity of living things that there are out there. And it's so important that we do that in a way that's consistent across cultures and, and languages um, to make sure that we're talking about the same thing. And that's really important because we use plants for so many things, whether it's for medicine, for food, and also, of course, for horticulture. And we need to know that we're talking about the same plants in order to use them consistently and to grow them consistently. For example, Michaelmas daisies are a flower we all have in our garden, but it's actually the common name for a number of different and actually unrelated flowering plants. We used to call them asters, but botanists discovered that although they looked very alike, many weren't related genetically at all. I think that the way I think of it is in terms of hierarchies. Um, so in a scientific name, you've got the first word is, is the genus. Um, so I'm standing next to a, a banana plant, which is in the genus Musa. Um, and then the specific epithet tells me that this exact species, which I believe might be Musa ornata, um, is um, different from another species of Musa. And then, just as you say, Alexandra, if we want to then um, break this down even further, on top of that we sometimes have varieties or forms and then also cultivars, which are often created artificially by man to create, for example, increasing yield of crops or particularly attractive cultivars of garden plants. And that's why we sometimes see um, uh, different names again. And these are, as I say, are cultivars. Um, but I think that um, in its most basic form, if we think of it in terms of the generic name and the specific name, and those are the two things that make up a scientific name. Why do you sometimes so many plants look different mm. but actually have to start with the same name? How, is there an explanation of that? There is. Um, so if we take begonia as an example, which is a, a very diverse group, and this is an interesting one because we've sort of borrowed the scientific name for the English name. So begonia is the genus name. So if written with a capital B and in italics, that's the scientific part. Um, but we've borrowed that for ease, and we also use it in the, in the general vernacular. So we can talk about begonias um, with a lowercase b and not italicised, and we're talking about the, exactly the same thing. Um, and that's a very diverse group with many different species. Um, with regard to the second part of your question, why do so many plants um, look similar or different and, and have the same or different names? Um, that very much comes down to the different groups of plants we're talking about. So um, I can think of an example, Senecio, um, sometimes called Senecio. That's a group of plants in the daisy family, the Asteraceae, and it's incredibly diverse. And different plants have such different forms. Some of them look like succulents. They, they appear to look like cacti, although they're not. And some of them look like the weedy species like Senecio vulgaris, the groundsel that we're familiar with in our gardens. Now those, believe it or not, belong to the same genus and we know that because we've looked at DNA sequence data. So underpinning this robust nomenclature system, this system of classification that we use, um, is a lot of um, very detailed analysis that ideally should look at the DNA sequence data, rather like DNA fingerprinting. And that can tell scientists very objectively what is related to what, rather than us relying on the morphology, which means the appearance of the plants, which we know from the genetic data can be very misleading. And it just so happens that some groups of plants have diversified and they grow in very different places 
cases and they're very closely related but they look very different um, and the opposite is also true and that's why the names are so important because it's an objective means of classification so through doing this DNA sequence data analysis what scientists have found is that some groups that we previously thought of as one group because they might have all looked similar when we actually look at the DNA what we've discovered is that they're actually quite different and that means that in order to be consistent with the way we classify plants and to be scientific we've had to sort of split them up a bit and um, I think an optimistic way of looking at it is that so much work has been done I think we can expect to see far fewer um, massive changes to how we classify and identify plants in the future so hopefully some of those names will remain a little bit more stable in the future. So it's like our system of identifying people by using first names and family names and perhaps titles only in reverse. I suggested to Chris that if he were a plant he might be called Farragut Chris Doctor. If you're wondering how to write Latin plant names, the first two names are in italics, with a capital letter just for the first one. Any cultivars or variety after that is in standard text. Perfectly Peculiar Plants is published by Quarto and it's aimed at 8 to 12 year olds, but I felt I learnt a lot for it, and it would be a great present for anyone wanting to interest their children in botany, conservation or gardening. This is a book that I hope will take children on a trip around the world to see some of the most peculiar, strange, weird and wacky parts that there are. And there's a serious message behind why I wrote this book. Really what I'd like to do is engage and enthuse children um, and help them to understand that plants are not just things of beauty that we grow for our own enjoyment, but plants are just as fascinating as animals. Often when we talk to people about conservation, people will think about uh, rhinoceroses, about tigers or lions, but they don't necessarily think about plants. And that's a really serious thing for someone like me as a botanist because up to one in five plants worldwide is threatened with extinction in the future. And we have to galvanise, engage and infuse a next generation of botanists. And so what I really hope will happen is that perfectly peculiar plants will infuse at least some children to think about plants in a different way and maybe to go on and study them um, in the future. And if you enjoy reading aloud to children, I think it would be a fun book for children younger than eight as well. The Oxford Botanic Gardens and Arboretum are the oldest botanic gardens in Britain and are open every day with different opening hours in winter and summer. So do visit them and see all the scientific names and the plants and just get a bit of an idea of how the different plant families tie into each other. If you've enjoyed this, please hit like because then I'll know you want to hear more about plants. And if you haven't subscribed to the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel, we upload on Saturdays with tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden.